Well, hello, this is Vincent Green, and we're going to continue our study in the book of Isaiah. We're in Isaiah chapter 1. We're looking at this sermon, this message of condemnation upon the nation of Judah because of their sin. And, and it's divided into three parts. And part number one, verses 2 to 9, we've already looked at this. God condemns the nation of Judah because of the rebellion in their heart. The rebellion is, that's what's on the inside, but it manifests itself. It manifests itself in two ways. Number one, it manifests itself, and we'll see this, verse 21 to 31, in unfaithfulness. But it also manifests itself in hypocrisy. And that's what we're looking at in verse 10 to 20. We've been in this section, I've entitled it, um, God's condemnation for empty religion. But this is the nation of Judah attempting to try to cloak their sin, trying to hide their sin, trying to hide the reality of their sin. And they don't want to see it. They don't want to deal with it. They don't want to have to process the reality that they are sinners at heart. They don't want to have to deal with their moral condition. And so they try to cover it up. And as we've been looking at this, we've seen that God hates that they're doing this. He hates the, the fact that they are trying to cover it up. He, he despises it, and He explains that in great detail. We've looked at that. But starting in verse 16, going down to verse 20, He tells them what they must do about it, how they should correct this. And it's all about repenting from sin, having faith in God, turning to Him, and acknowledging Him. Let me read these verses to you. I like to do that each time. And then we're going to focus our attention on verse 19 today. Listen to the Lord, you leaders of Sodom. Listen to the law of our God, people of Gomorrah. What makes you think I want all your sacrifices, says the Lord? I am sick of your burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fattened cattle. I get no pleasure from the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. When you come to worship me, who ask you to parade through my courts with all your ceremony? Stop bringing me your meaningless gifts. The incense of your offerings disgusts me. As for your celebrations of the new moon and the Sabbath and your special days for fasting, they're all sinful and false. I want no more of your pious meetings. I hate your new moon celebrations and your annual festivals. They are a burden to me. I cannot stand them. When you lift up your hands in prayer, I will not look. Though you offer many prayers, I will not listen. For your hands are covered with the blood of innocent victims. Wash yourselves and be clean. Get your sins out of my sight. Give up your evil ways. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Help the oppressed. Defend the cause of orphans. Fight for the rights of widows. Come now, let's settle this, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, I will make them as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, I will make them as white as wool. If you will only obey me, you will have plenty to eat. But if you turn away and refuse to listen, you will be devoured by the sword of your enemies. I, the Lord, have spoken. Like I said, in verse 16 to 20, we focus on what they should do to correct the problem. Their problem is their, their sin in their heart. Their sin is dominating their heart and it's manifesting itself. Yes, as we will see, unfaithfulness later in the chapter. But right now, it's manifesting what's being addressed. It's mani their, their sin is manifesting in the form of empty religion. This is what dominates them. They're trying to cover it up, trying to put the veneer on. And God says, that won't work. It's actually worse to do something like that because it feeds the delusion that you think that you can cover up your sinfulness. It feeds the delusion that you think you can cover it all up and that I won't see you and I won't see your sin.
But the reality is, you need to get your heart right with God. That's what Isaiah is telling them. God is saying you better get your heart right with Him. It's your heart that matters. It's the inside. It's the real you. It's your soul. That's what needs to be straightened out. And what he deals with in verse 16 to 20, he lays out what has to happen, how their hearts can be corrected. It's through repentance, verse 16, and faith, verse 17. And there's eight statements here, three in regards to repentance, five in regards to faith. We've looked at those in detail but you must repent from sin, see your sin for what it is, and turn away from it and turn to God who can save you. And then starting in verse 18, he says, let's bring it together here. You need to acknowledge me. You need to confess me. You need to acknowledge that everything I've told you about you is true, that everything I've said about you is true, it's real, that you are living in sin against me, that based on this trajectory, based on where you're going, you're not going to end up in the right place. I'm here to tell you. And so he says, come now, let's settle this, says the Lord. That's his call, his exhortation, his clarion call, his raising the trumpet blast for them to come to him, come to me, come now, and then let's settle this, let's talk this out. Because it's not like we're going to negotiate a plan. No, you're going to hear that I've already told you you're a sinner. I've already told you that you're living in sin. What we have to settle is what you're going to do about it. Do you want to address it? Do you want to repent from your sins and, and turn to me in faith? <coughs> what are you going to do? And in terms of acknowledging the Lord, what the Lord does here in verse 18 and in verse 19 and 20, what he does is he gives them two reasons why they are to acknowledge him. They are to acknowledge His sovereign rule. They are to acknowledge that He is God. They are to acknowledge that He is Lord. He gives them two reasons. Two reasons. And we saw the first one already. It's in verse 18. Though your sins are like scarlet, I will make them as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, I will make them as white as wool. And basically what he's saying is, I am the only one, says the Lord. I am the only one. God is the only one that can cleanse you from your sin. He has established it that way. No one else can cleanse you from your sin. No priest, no, no amount of ritual, no amount of, 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 of uh, ceremony, none of that is going to take away your sin. It's not. You have to come to me on my terms. You need to go by the way of Abel, not the way of Cain. That's what he's saying. God is the only one that can cleanse you, any person, from sin. Your sins are like scarlet. They're red like crimson. I can cleanse them. I can make them white as snow, white as wool. And we saw all the details of that. Well, moving on from that reason, he provides the second reason, and this is verse 19 and 20, and we began to look at this last time. We're going to finish looking at verse 19 today, and then next session will be verse 20, and so we'll cover this in two more sessions. So verse 19 and 20 is going to be three sessions total. But he basically says, not only am I, is God the one that is the only one that can cleanse you from your sin, God is the one who will judge every person because of their sin. You see, the point he's making is that God is the judge. God is the one who is the ultimate judge, and his judgment is full and final, and you stand will stand before him, everyone stands before him to give an account of their life in front of him. 
You're not an independent person. He created you. He brought you into this world. Psalm 139. You are accountable to Him. Hebrews chapter 4. I've read that a few times already. He, he, he is the Lord. He is God. He is sovereign. And you are accountable to Him. And that's what He says here. In verse 19 and 20. And, he, and, he, and I talked about the if clauses. There's two here, uh, more if statements in verse 19 and 20. If you will, but if you turn away. That's the idea of if you will not. So these are in contrast to each other. He paints a picture and he, he says, are you saved or lost? Righteous, unrighteous, evil, good. Um, um, are you going down the broad road or are you in the narrow road? It's the same dichotomy, the same distinction. Verse 19, if you will only obey me. But verse 20, if you turn away and refuse to listen, <coughs> that's disobedience. See, God lays it out very authoritatively. Which, which way are you going to go? Which way are you going to head? Which way are you going to, what path are you going to follow? It's very important that you understand that. There's only two options here. The idea of will, as we noticed last time, is the de to desire something, to want something. And when he added the word only, it meant a singular focus. This should be what you're focused upon. What is that? To obey me. And obey, the concept of obey is connected to the will. It's the heart's desire that accompanies obedience. You see, they're rebels at heart, and so there's going to be a manifested disobedience. Sadly, tragically, but what they should want to do, what should be the desire of their hearts is to obey the Lord. Now, Isaiah is not saying that we have the ability in and of ourselves to obey, to will and obey the Lord. No, that goes back to the sovereignty of God and how he works in our desires and works to, to do that which is in his uh, good pleasure, for his good pleasure. But he's making this kind of statement, painting this kind of contrast, because Judah is filled with sin. They're filled with corruption, right? That's what God said earlier in the, in, at the beginning of the sermon. The children I've raised and cared for have rebelled against me. They don't recognize me. They don't recognize my character. They don't recognize who I am. They're very sinful. They're loaded with guilt. They're evil people. They're corrupt children. They've rejected me. They've despised me. They've even turned their backs on me. So you get the you see where they're coming from. They are sinful people and they're being probed and prodded and 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 pricked because they have to wake up out of their blindness, out of their stupor. And God is the authoritative one who will speak because everyone's accountable to him. You know, there's an interesting story in the book of Matthew, Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21. It says um, Jesus' authority is challenged. When Jesus returned to the temple and began teaching, the leading priests and the elders came up to him they demanded, by what authority are you doing all these things? Who gave you the right? Who gave you the right, Jesus, to talk like this? Huh? To demand things. Who do you think you are, God? Well, he is. By what authority are you doing all these things? You know, I mean, they're not asking for the sake of a question. 
He said, I'll tell you by what authority I do these things if you answer one question. Did John's authority to baptize come from heaven, meaning from God, or was it merely human? Did he just decide to go out there one day on his own, apart from God, doing this deal? So where did that come from? Did this come from God or just his own mere wishes? Well, they talked it over amongst themselves. And they're saying, if we say it was from heaven, he will ask us why we didn't believe John. (laughs) Well, we can't go that way. But if we say it was merely human, well, we'll be mobbed by the people because the people believe John was a prophet. Either they, (laughs) they can't believe God is true. They can't believe that Jesus is God. They can't believe that, and they don't believe that John did his ministry because God sent him there. That's not even into their theology. That's that's they can't deal that. So, <laughs> but they don't want to say it's mere human either because they fear people. They live in fear. So they they finally replied, "We don't know." <laughs> the Pharisees prided themselves. The religious leaders. They prided themselves, especially the ones in the temple. The, this is not the just any priest, any elder. This is the leading priests, the leading elders. These are the guys who have all the knowledge. At least that's what they tell you. These are the movers and the shakers of the religious establishment. And they don't know the answer? Strange. Well, what is the answer? Pretty clear. God sent John into the wilderness to preach, teach, baptize. It was in the sovereign plan of God. Jesus came into this world, God with us, Emmanuel, sent by God. He is the Son of God. But they don't get it. Jesus responded, well, then I won't tell you by what authority I do these things. I'm not going to answer your question. (laughs) So Jesus just looks at him and goes, our Lord has all authority. All authority resides in him. But But the first conditional statement here There's a contrast, right? So the first one is positive. If you would only obey me, this is a good thing. If they would, they're not inclined to. They're going to be more inclined to go the route of verse 20. But if they would only obey, you can see that God's pleading through Isaiah, pleading and begging, just like Paul would tell us in 2 Corinthians, that we beg you, be reconciled to God. That's what that's what's happening here. Be reconciled to God. How are you reconciled to God? Through repentance and faith and acknowledging the Lord. He says if you would only obey, then notice what comes next. This is a beautiful statement. This is a rejoicing type of statement. You will have plenty to eat. Now, wait a minute. Is, what is this? Is this a material blessing? Plenty to eat? Yeah. Wait, 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 wait. Is this the health and wealth gospel? No. Far from it. <laughs> You know what this is? This is fulfillment of the Mosaic Covenant. You remember Deuteronomy chapter 28, 1 to 9? See the blessings and the cursings? Remember that? Their land would yield increase. They would be saved from pestilence, war, famine. They would be saved from the curses in the covenant. 
They would receive blessings. That's what God, through Isaiah, is reiterating here. In other words, and this is the principle that runs through Scripture, I am going to take care of you. I am going to provide for you. I am going to keep you secure. You want to know how it sounds like in the New Testament? All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, because He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. Even before He made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in His eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into His own family by bringing us to Himself through Jesus Christ. This is what He wanted to do, and it gave Him great pleasure. So He praised God for the glorious grace He has poured out on us who belong to His dear Son. He is so rich in kindness and grace that He purchased our freedom with the blood of His Son and forgave our sins. He has showered His kindness on us, along with all the wisdom and understanding. And He's revealed to us His mistress will, mysterious will regarding Christ, which is to fulfill His own good plan. We have so many blessings. Peter would say it this way. By His divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. We have received all of this by coming to know Him, the One who called us to Himself by means of His marvelous glory and excellence. And because of His glory and excellence, He has given us great and precious promises These are the promises that enable you to share His divine nature, to share in it, and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. That's like a sermon, a series of sermons right there. So with Ephesians. I mean, we we have so many blessings. What God is saying is, if you will obey me, This is the only option you have. You are a sinner. You have committed sin. God's perfect. God never sinned. You've sinned. I've sinned. We are the sinner. We are the one who has sinned against God. We stand accountable to Him. And and, and since we are accountable to Him, we stand under His judgment. But if we would obey Him, obey Him, follow the commands listed in verse 16 and 17, which emphasize repentance and faith. It's not do-good-ism. It's repentance and faith. You need to have a heart change. You, you, need to, you need to not be rebellious in your hearts. You need to have a heart of love for the Lord, a heart of, of seeing your sin and the emptiness of it and the, and the sadness of it and the tragedy of it. And you need to turn from that. You need a cleansed heart, a transformed heart. You need to pursue Him. Deal with truth and reality. And he says, I will give you plenty to eat. Remember what he said back up in verse 7 and 8? Your country lies in ruins. Your towns are burned. Foreigners plunder your fields before your eyes. They destroy everything they see. Get the idea? They're plundering your... They're taking away your goods. They're taking away your food. Remember when um, back in Genesis when... um, King Keterleomer and his allies went against the other kings and they plundered the fields and took Lot. I mean, you get the picture. They're taking belongings. They're taking things. This is, this is the opposite of that. God will give you plenty to eat, he says. I will bless you. And the blessing, what is that? What is that sign? It's a sign of, that the blessing is a sign that God, re- that God sees you that He physically sees you, that He knows you, that you are His. 
He just takes care of you. It's not that he makes you healthy and wealthy and, 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 and why would he do that? Because that feeds the flesh. But it just means he takes care of you. He's going to meet the needs that you have. He's going to allow you to serve him and worship him and adore him and follow after him. And speak about him. While you're still living in this life, before you go to be with him. It's how you walk by faith. It will strengthen your faith. Plenty. Literally, it's the good of the land. Remember in Genesis, um, Adam's in the Garden of Eden. And God says, I got all these trees, all this fruit. Have, have, knock yourself out. Here you go. You can eat from any of these fruit trees. Any. Except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There was the test. But look at all the bounty. The, literally, the good of the land. The word good means the best. You can look that up in Genesis 45, verse 18, 20, and 23. They're going to live from the best of the land. This is a, a picture of tranquility and peace and full and complete enjoyment, which, by the way, to give you a preview, we're going to read about that in the book of Isaiah. There's passages that talk about that, about what is peace and what is tranquility. And, and, and guess when that time period begins? Guess when, guess when that really takes place? It's in the future, even our future. Future from not, it hasn't never happened. And it's going to happen in the millennial kingdom. That's a message for another day. When it says the good of the land, that's the promised land, that's Canaan, that's their present home. So this it's it really, when he says you have plenty to eat, it's... It's dealing with a physical thing here. It's dealing with a physical thing, physical piece of land, the produce from the land. It's picturing the millennial kingdom, which is real. It's going to happen. It's going to be on earth. But when God says you'll have plenty to eat, Yes, it's material, but it's spiritual. Notice what is said here in Isaiah chapter 43. This kind of is a, a more extensive commentary of that phrase. But forget all that. It is nothing compared to what I'm going to do. I'm about, this is God speaking, I am about to do something new. See, I've already begun. Do you not see it? I will make a pathway through the wilderness. I will create rivers in the dry wasteland. The wild animals in the fields will thank me. The jackals and the owls too, for giving them water in the desert. Yes, I will make rivers in the dry wasteland so my chosen people can be refreshed. I have made Israel for myself and they will someday honor me before the whole world. You'll have plenty to eat. Remember, God told Jeremiah and he recorded it. I have plans, plans for peace and for good for you. I'm speaking to the people of Israel, to the, specifically to the nation of Judah. That in the long term, God has a plan. The key is, are you going to trust Him? Are you going to entrust your life to Him? Are you going to believe what He says? 
You know, you're going to doubt what he says? That's what Eve, or that's what Satan told Eve to do. You're not going to die. God says you're going to die. You're not going to die. Doubt God's word. Doubt God's character. Doubt God's glory. That's what, that's, that, that, that's what Satan was trying to get Eve to do. Doubt, 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 so that she would go her own path. And she took the bait. And sin came into this world. See, obeying the Lord means you follow Him. You worship Him. You adore Him. You come to Him. You come to Him on His terms. You come to Him bowing to Him. Read God's Word. Read the truth. Drink it in. Expose yourself to the Scriptures. Expose yourself to God and His Word. And He will show you what you need to know. He will show you what you need to hear. You will hear it. Follow Him. Entrust your heart to Him through repentance and faith. This is the gospel message. This is the truth. But what about those who say, No, God, I'm going to go my own path. I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to live my own life. Hmm. They reject. What about them? Not good what happens. That's verse 20. We'll look at that next time. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we, we see the truth. It's so clear. To either adore you, worship you, or walk away from you. Lord, we cannot walk away. Not if we truly know you. You are Lord and God. You reign supreme in this world. It's so true. So very true. Lord, we are lost without you. Lord, we are undone. We're wretched, vile. You came into this world to die for us. Sacrifice your life for us. Rise again. Satisfied the wrath that would come upon us. You took it upon yourself. so that we could be saved and have a hope. A hope that will never fade away. You redeemed us. And you transform us. And one day we'll see you face to face. We'll be in your presence, enter your glory. What a day that will be. A wonderful day. But Lord, even today, even in this sinful world that we that you brought us into, Lord, you've made us to be a shining light to it. Lord, we are not adequate for it. But Lord, you equip us, you lead us, and you guide us. May you receive all the glory, all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> so we got one more verse to go. Verse 20. 
It's a very tragic verse, but it paints the picture that needs to be said. Tell others about the series. Tell others about the book study, study in Isaiah. We also have a study in Genesis, other studies on the channel. May the Lord continue to bless you. Take care, and we'll see you next time.